Good evening and welcome to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim. Hi, Tim. There's a reason you don't have a microphone tonight. Yours truly forgot to bring it because there was a chance that Brown may not have been here. I took it home for safekeeping, and of course, I left it in my garage. Oh, man. Thank you. With that, um, I want to welcome all of you to the College of Complexes, and I better sit down and let Brown take over this. Mary Fiasco tonight. Why do we have such a big immigration mess? We're going to hear all about the big immigration mess, the solution to it from Wow, Brom. Henry? Okay, you're on. Thank you very much. And uh, I decided today to approach the problem slightly differently. Uh, when it comes to discussing immigration, most often people approach the problem that way, that they have certain set of values, things which are important to them, the values, the moral, political values, and then they say, well, okay, follow those values, this is how we have to address the immigration. My Okay. My approach is that we have to recognize that the immigration system which we have is not working. Whatever we do doesn't work. We have a big mess and from this perspective I try to take an approach of an engineer. I'm an engineer by training. So otherwise I try to troubleshoot the system and in order to troubleshoot I have to understand it. So I want to look into some kind of small historic perspective. When I look at that, I'm just getting ahead what my conclusions were, I de de defined and found out that there are three factors which make our immigration system not working. First is xenophobia in America. Second is socialism, using too much socialism, we'll be talking about it. And third is lack of deliberative democracy. And those first two will talk a little bit more later. The lack of deliberative democracy, I have to give you a little bit of hope uh, because what you do here, as much as imperfect it is, and there were more people before, you do what is really needed in America. Have people meet of different opinions and trying to talk and understand what is going on. We really don't have it, and this is what we really badly need. So thank you very much for those your meetings, and thank you for inviting. Let uh, when we look at the historical perspective, in the cut of date I will talk about a little later for me is 1924. Before that, for about 150 years of the republic, immigration was mostly unfettered. There were a very little uh, limitations for immigrants from Europe. Asia, for all practical reasons, was cut off, so Africa. Uh, immigration was welcomed to great extent by the need of colonization of the new territories. So there were the whole programs that, let's say, people found out there's some new territory somewhere, you know, who knows where, west of Mississippi, and there were some arrangements made, and a few hundred people from Germany, from Sweden, from Norway, from England, from Ireland, Ireland, they just got on the boat, and when they arrived, they had everything arranged, that they went to some place, and there were some arrangements made that they bought, get uh, the lease or whatever for the land, and they settled, and they, you know, operated over there. And that kind of immigration was very welcome for all practical most of the time. Pretty soon, I mean, we're talking about the first big wave of anti-immigration sentiment. It was in uh, 1850s when there was increase of Irish immigration due to uh, famine, the potato famine, 1848-1852. And many of these poor people settled in urban areas. And for all practical reasons, for the old time, Every time when the immigration settled in the industrialized areas, they compete with people who settled before. And as they are new arrivals, they tend to uh, 
accept lower pay, work harder, and of course, compete with people who settled before and, and want to take benefits out. So, the first strong anti-immigration movement was in the middle of the uh, 19th century, about 1850s, when basically Irish do not apply, signs were here and there, and Irish basically were Catholics, drunks, they really were bad people, okay? okay? Uh, somehow parallel to that was, for most of the 19th century, was some anti-German sentiment, because Germans were the largest uh, uh, foreign population coming, and that sentiment was a little lower because of most of the German uh, immigrants, they were coming in the prayer land and settlement uh, configuration. So otherwise there were a few hundred people who came and settled somewhere in the rural Texas, Minnesota, Wisconsin, and they were basically creating their own communities governed by their own rules. The uh, very strong anti-German uh, mean sentiment uh, arose around the World War I, when suddenly Americans said, well, we fought with Germans and we have so many Germans here, okay? okay. And then the people found out that there were the whole German communities that basically German language was spoken in the store, in the church, in the city hall, in the school. They were completely German. So there was very strong anti-German sentiment and there were some uh, uh, laws which uh, Supreme Court, you know, uh, didn't let uh, uh, stay to force basically abandoning the German language. But with all the press, German gradually get uh, 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 assimilated. The very strong anti-immigration moment happened also when uh, by the second half of the, the 19th century, the railroads were built all over the country. And for those railroads, uh, mostly for the western part of the country, there was uh, uh, strong immigration or, or uh, uh, kind of big numbers immigration of uh, Chinese people. And of course, one more time, Americans said, well, they take our jobs, okay? And of course, you know, who wants the people who look like that in America, okay? So that uh, xenophobia sentiment also played a role. And in 1884, there was a basically first strict anti-immigration law that basically banned immigration of Chinese. When Chinese were stopped, there were some, you know, uh, uh, arrangement made to bring Japanese people, which also they, they wanted to come. There, uh, there was some a little bit of politics between U.S. and Japan, and after Japan conquered a little bit of Asia during the war 905-907, USA got the gentleman agreement with the uh, Japanese uh, government that they will force all people who wanted to uh, emigrate from Japan toward China, Korea, Taiwan, and we will not let them go to America. So basically this was kind of a nice way putting in, uh, in uh, Japanese hands the anti-immigration policies here. Uh, at the beginning of, of the 20th century, the end of 19th century, the immigration change after 1890 mostly, uh, there were basically not enough people in Germany, England, and, and, and you know, Scandinavia who still wanted to emigrate. Basically, most people who want to emigrate, they already did. So, at that time, the immigration to the United States become more attractive for Eastern European people. Uh, Poland, uh, that Poland didn't exist, but basically the territories of today's Poland, Russia, uh, you know, all that uh, Southeastern uh, uh, Europe, uh, Italy, Spain, all those people suddenly got also attracted to that concept of immigrating to the United States. And one more time, as those were the people speaking different languages, in general, the education level of these people was lower than, let's say, those from uh, Germany or Italy. 
So there was very strong anti-immigration sentiment by the end, mostly by the end of the 19th century, the beginning of the 20th century. In the result of that, uh, the politicians decided that we need to do something about it. So they called it the Dillingham Commission. Dillingham was a senator uh, at that time who was the chief of the commission. If you go on Google and Google that, there will be thousands, literally thousands of pages of the work they have done. It is tremendous work. They sent their uh, agent to all the countries where immigrants were coming. In, uh, in, in uh, uh, basically talk with local uh, governments, talk with local community leaders. Uh, they did uh, tremendous statistical work when it comes who comes ca uh, and when from uh, who stays, who goes back. They did tremendous work uh, trying to understand how the assimilation takes, uh, takes place. How it means, uh, how soon people start talking English. They took a lot of work studying how immigrants use uh, welfare. They went down to all those uh, non-profit welfare organizations, churches, and so on, and across the country, and they did tremendous work on that. And that the purpose of that was to have better understanding what the immigration is all about and what the country can do about it. The amount of data which they collected is unbelievable. The conclusion they did, they were similar to those as we are doing right now. Even if the currently we don't do such a good studies, before they make the conclusion, they already know what the decision needs to be made. Uh, when it comes to the anti-immigration sentiment at the beginning of the 20th century, the, can I get a little copy? Yeah. Uh, the special note should be made for the anti-Semitism. Uh, as I'm Polish and I have a little bit of better understanding of the history of Jews in Europe, because they mostly live in Poland, I can tell you that what's happened in, in Poland that Jews were accepted about six, seven hundred years ago on the premise that there will be craftsmen, traders, musicians, whatever. Not they, they couldn't own the land because those were the Polish nobles. And Polish nobles, they were above doing trade, finances, uh, art. They were for you know, owning the land and defending the country. In that kind of uh, division of labor, Jews. Uh, had uh, uh, all the conditions to grow to the strength and prominence using those liberties given to them. And with Jewish tradition is that every Jew needs to uh, learn how to read in order to understand the Bible and needs to have some basic understanding of arithmetic in order to be a trader. So that kind of uh, uh, tradition of valuing, valuing the education put Jews in the very good position when the capitalists came because they had all the tools to benefit from it. And they did very good in Europe. And then they start coming to US. That when you uh, uh, read those reports of the Dillingham Commission, they will be telling you that there are whole segment in New York that there are some strange people who you know look strange, talk different language, and there are evidence that they cannot, you know, assimilate. Of course, Jews. Okay, and that's not even straightforward in many places. At the same time, what was aggravating Americans that in colleges of New York at the beginning of 20th century, Jews were anywhere between 20 to 40 percent of admissions. Jews were about two percent of the country, but in colleges. They were about uh, 20 to 40 percent. So, it, of course, it is not true that they don't assimilate, okay? Because they go to the colleges. So, they were the, the real threat to the establishment that, you know, suddenly there will be new people who will have something to say. So, this is basically how the anti immigration uh, uh, started. When we want to understand how the immigration before 1924 worked, 
and I'm mentioning here 1921 because the law, which was 1924, was first temporarily set on 1921. So what, what was going on before basically 1921 and later legalized in 1924 was that there was something which we don't experience right now. People freely were removing back and forth. About one third of people who arrived and declared at the gate that I want to settle in America, after a year or two they go back. Sometimes they came back one more time. So there was tremendous, despite the ability to communicate were not close to that what we have right now, the movement back and forth was tremendous. It's something which we don't realize. There is the nice uh, uh, story in the uh, history of Polish immigrants, which many of them uh, came b before the World War I, and after the World War I, Poland gained independence. So, of course, the uh, Polish government over there and, you know, wanted to get those people back. They wanted their money. So, there was, a, I remember from reading somewhere in my Polish books, there was a big conference of, of those American, uh, of Polish Americans in the, I think, 1921, 1922, something like that, and uh, there was, you know, what we're going to do, and there was the question, which those Poles from Poland asked those people, okay, so when you are coming back? We are not going back, we like it here, okay? Yeah. So otherwise, there was perception from the movement back and forth that people came here to work, make some money, and go over their back. And what's happened, that many people who started with that approach. They uh, ended up, you know, I like it here. I don't go back over there. However, when it goes to that approach, there was some natural process of selection. There is the story which uh, I heard once on National Public Radio. There was a young Jewish uh, reporter who simply started digging, there was a woman, who started digging the history of the family and she found out that the family had some family in Poland because they came, you know, her, I think, great grandfather came from Poland. And, you know, just kind of nobody wanted to talk about it. And there was no that they were killed during the Holocaust. But, you know, she was curious why they don't talk about it. What happened? That there was, I think, her grandfather, great grandfather, who I think just before the World War I, 1910, 1912, there were a few brothers. And, you know, some of them, few of them came here as the young guys, 18, 20, or whatever. And some of them, they like it here. They get it here, they start making money. The other ones, they simply, they couldn't keep the pace. They didn't like it. And they were mostly the burden to the family. So the brothers let them just go back to Poland. Okay? 25 years passed, the middle of late of 30s, the, those guys in America, they were not doing great, but they were, you know, well off. They were not very rich, but they, you know, uh, were sec financially secure and doing fine. The other guys in Poland financially weren't doing so bad, but they were seeing what is coming. So they were sending those, you know, emergency letters, just, you know, do something so we can, you know, leave Poland. And for all practical reasons, that was hard because of the law to bring those guys here, okay? So it will cost a lot of money for the family to overcome all those obstacles. But also, they simply didn't want them. Because they said, why should I pay extra money to bring these people here when they already proved me that they cannot meet it. So I need to spend the money to bring them and then support them. So basically, they didn't want to bring them. Okay? Well, when they were killed, they had a little bit of calm of conscience. They said they didn't want to talk about it. But that story gives you an understanding how people came and assimilated here, okay? Uh, this is from the Dillingham report. You see that, uh, I don't know if you can see it, but the, the, uh, they showed that about well, 100 people who, in the years 1908, 1909, 1910, 32 people uh, uh, returned to, to European, but those guys from old immigration, mostly England, Germany, and Scandinavia, there were only 13. From new immigration, mostly Italians, Poles, Jews, there were 37. They have one more that they show that Italians were almost 55%. So basically what we are talking about, that uh, we have, so that simply 
uh, uh, Italians were coming in even, uh, uh, they were the sort of even in the greater extent. So that's, okay. Uh, the most important event in the history of immigration is the Immigration Act of 1924. And those anti-immigration uh, moods, which I mentioned, they resulted that in 1917 there was the law which whoever wants to come needed to pass some literacy text in test in any language. That just one. They increased the uh, small tax. There was some small tax. They made it a little larger. Uh, and <coughs> were still barred. Okay. Uh, that uh, act was temporary provision. Basically, what happened after the World War One, America started freaking out that there will be a flood of people, and they say we, we don't want it. So there was the Provisional Act 1921, which basically what they said, and this is interesting, they said that we will let to the country from any other countries three percent per year, three percent of the number of residents which were in the United States. In, 19, in 1890. 1890 is before the immigration from your Eastern Europe and Italy started. So they basically want to rule out Poles, Jews, all those Russians, uh, Italians, just, just want to keep it, uh, uh, you know, uh, yes. Okay. And I just quote here, there was a, a chairman of the House Committee, Albert Johnson, when he went to uh, Ellis, uh, Ellis Island in 1920, he said, the country does not realize the menace of immigration. So basically, there was the mood in the country that immigration is the problem. Okay? Okay. So then they came out with the Permanent Act of 1924. The purpose they state is to preserve the ideal of American homogeneity. You guess what it is? Okay. They set the quotas of 155,000 per year and then they lowered that country origin quota to 2% of the numbers from people who went to, who came to the, uh, who were living in the country in 1890. After a certain few years, I think gradually from 1927, they change it to the fixed numbers. So basically they allocate it. Okay. Uh, this is the very interesting number. This is, it shows you in absolute numbers how many immigrants or people who claim they come to be immigrants. Like I said they were coming back and forth. Were they coming per year? And so it just is one million per year. This is million point two. And this is in the 1910, 1913, 1907. There was almost 800 in 1883. So basically, those. And then after the immigration law took effect, it, it was gradually implemented. It coincided with the Great Recession. And then you got the numbers which are basically very low. Okay? basically until the, uh, 1946, after the World War II. I will talk a little bit about those numbers later. This is the other number, the other graph. This graph shows the number of immigrants per number of people living in the country in a given year. So otherwise, in top of the immigration, there was 1.6. Oh, thank you very much. How I can use it. Oh, oh, that, that's the way. Yeah, thank you very much. So in uh, in top of, or in the middle, of the, I think this is the Irish famine time, for every 100 people in America, 1.6 came. So for every 1,000 people, 16 people uh, were coming uh, this year. And those, those high numbers were until the beginning of, of, of 1920s. And then was the low. And the never recuperate. They had this uh, 18, uh, 1986 uh, amnesty. Okay? So basically, the immigration which we had in 19th century never rebounded to that level. Okay? This is, this is uh, something which is very interesting to give you the picture. I pulled it from some uh, government publication from 1929. 
and this gives you the immigration quota for, I think it was 1929, they lived it. So at that time, immigration quota was 164,000 people a year. And you remember that about uh, uh, 50 years before, there was 100, 1 million people coming here. So you see how they cut. And this is, it gives you some, I took, I added in this color, those are my notes. So let's say, Ireland, who had at that time 3 million uh, residents, <coughs> was given the quota of 28,567 people. Somebody really liked the government. They always do it you know, so, so detailedly. How they figured out the number, I don't know, but they, needed, they, they, they knew it. So uh, Ireland was given 28,000 uh, immigrants. Poland, which was about almost 10, nine times larger than population-wise than Ireland, was given 5,982 allocation for immigration. So it's basically, yeah. So uh, Russia, which is, you know, was even about, what, six times larger than Poland, was given even less than that. Italy, where is the Italy? Because, oh, Lithuania. Italy was 40 million people, they were given only 3,800. So the Italians are not good Americans, apparently, according to that, and so on, and so on. So this is kind of example for you, how the, how the government Look at that. And that's what's happened. Uh, this is the, the immigration. How many uh, percent of immigrants who arrived, whether from Northern uh, and Western Europe, how many are sold in Eastern Europe? So before 1980, they were mostly from that section. In this time, more than half were from over there. During this decade, most were from there. This was a little less. After they started introducing the laws, one more time, Poles, Jews, uh, Greeks, Italians were not allowed, and there was more immigrants from Western Europe. What is my interpretation of the 1924 uh, immigration? Those what I showed you before, you call it whatever you want it, I call it legalized xenophobia. Okay? And we can argue about it, okay? The other thing is beliefs in socialism. I will talk a little bit about more. And this basically believe that the central government can manipulate society. And of course, if they look in scientific way into Dillingham report data and took an effort to understand the process, they will come out with the conclusion that let's say those people who uh, came a little later, they will need additional 10 years to assimilate. And we're talking about legalized uh, xenophobia. Asians were denied entry. Eastern Europeans were granted limited access. We talk about it. The same like Italians, Greeks, and Spaniards. Jews basically were manipulated out of the system. There is the line of conversation that behind that act of 1924 there was the strong anti-semitism sentiment because at that time Poland which gained independence in 1918 was grossly uh, overpopulated, under-industrialized and had about three millions of Jews who almost each of them had already someone living in America so there was, because of those problems, there was a little bit of anti-Semitism in Poland, so the Jews want to go, but they didn't want to go because of the anti-Semitism in Poland. They want to go because there was an the opportunity they want to capture, okay? And uh, this particular approach, and this is something which created precedence, which we basically live with it for, for, for until today. They enforce it in the views of America. The USA is like an exclusive club with a high entry threshold. In 19th century, whoever wants to come and work here, get on the boat, <coughs> you can pass the, 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 the gate that he had no tuberculosis, was able to work, come in, okay? And after 1924, there was created the legal structure and the mental structure in America. The America, USA is the 
exclusive clubs that not everybody can get into. Okay? <coughs> and that's basically kind of you know the pattern lines of American <coughs> socialism. Okay? We many of you like that that that, 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 that thing, so you know that the socialism was growing mostly in nineteenth century and basically was the response to the shortcomings of the free market capitalism. And there was a very interesting experiment uh, that socialism was proven to work in uh, Poland. This is the Polish province, which today Poland is uh, around Poznań, if somebody knows history, the geography of Poland. What happened at that time, that part of Poland was under German occupation, and Mr. Bismarck, who everybody knows is a good uh, you know, counselor of Germany, from the Polish perspective, he was SOB who hate Poles and want to all of them Germanize. So his policies over toward that occupied Polish territory was basically to suppress econ economically people living there, mostly Polish farmers. So after you know the popularity of the socialist kind of aroused a little bit, so he said, well, let's try on those Poles how the socialists work. So in that province, he created certain rules and economic environment that, you know, if you want to create cooperatives and do all those kind of socialist uh, uh, Bismarck. Bismarck, yeah. Yeah, if, if you want to do, uh, you know, cooperative actions, cooperative, you know, uh, ventures, so he said you can do it. And it worked fine because for those poor Poles over there, there was only one kind of economic freedom they could get. So they captured that economic freedom, and it worked very well and basically strengthened the, the Polish element in those occupying Polish provinces, but was proven later on, and you find it somewhere in the books, that the socialism was proven to work, okay? You have to remember that uh, in uh, uh, after the World War I, in 19, by the end of uh, World War I, 1917, there was the uh, October Revolution in uh, Russia, and uh, they won, and in uh, 1922 they created the Soviet Union. And today, we all, all know that this was a failure. But at that time, the, for the whole world, there was the promise that something new, which is basically central government, may work, and this is promising. So what's happened is that all the world was looking at that, that this is something which we may try as well, okay? You have to see the prohibition which was voted in when, 1920, I guess, okay? Yes. Was on the same way of thinking. Society has a problem. People drink too much, there's disintegration of the, of the communities, of the families, also, also. The government needs to walk in, and cut it off. So there was the belief that if government takes action, can basically make sociality, society better. So that kind of socialistic approach was the part of the thinking of the era. Okay. So at this point, there was also you know that first time uh, you know motive that the government should protect the jobs of Americans. That's where it started. What are the consequences? Okay. One of the consequences which I read uh, uh, makes opinions, what is the connection between the limiting immigration in the act of 24 and the Great Depression? Some people believe that this was one of the pivotal contribution, uh, contributing factors to the deepness of the Great Depression, because there were other factors. So. But what happened, the uh, new arrivals, they are in great extent, they were working in construction, and new people coming generated needs for new construction. So simply, as soon as the act passed, passed out, and the quotes were, the construction basically went flat, broke, okay? So this was the, uh, and, and of course it's hard to say to which extent 
it counts, or but is agreement that it contributed to the deepness of the Great Depression. What's happened? That Immigration Act of 24, for the first time, put the price tag for the sole fact of the ability to be in the U.S. and live here. Before, where I can get the you know, few dollars, buy the ticket, could come here and work. After this act, there was the high threshold, and basically you can put the price tag on it. Because, you know, the, it was not so easy to get into. So those two factors, uh, those, this factor created basically for the first time environment for the black market. Every time the government put the limitation, you cannot get something, there's the black market. And every time when the government makes the law which limits the freedom of people, not based on some universal moral values which we all share, okay? If the government tell me I cannot come and hit you, okay, I understand it because next time you can come and hit me. So this is the universal moral value, basically don't do to others what you don't want it to be done to you. But if the government tell me I cannot hire you, okay, because he wants to be hired by me, I don't see the moral value in it. So simply, if I can circumvent the law, I'll hire you and not hire him because for whatever the reason I, you know, want your, uh, you know, your work more than than his or whatever it is, okay. And I don't see your work it cheaper. Right? Yes, and I don't, and I don't see it immoral, okay. So this is, and all those two factors, okay, they basically didn't act right away because of the Great Depression. Most people even left the United States. Then there was World War II. So all those factors created then basically didn't appear for quite a while. What's happened after the World War II, there was a, a pressure mostly from people who escaped from the uh, Eastern Europe when you know the Soviet Union took the Soviet the, the part of Eastern Europe so were there were many refugees after the World War II and they tried to get into the United States so there was one more time lamento what's going to happen if we let them come then uh, and if we send a message that we welcome them. They in millions will be leaving all the Soviet Union black and we cannot handle them. <coughs> so there was one more time, there was a, a pressure to stop that uh, immigration. So there was, the result of that, there was the Immigration and National Act of 1952. If we are talking to people about the immigration law in America, Many people will tell you that this is the fundamental of the immigration law as we have it now. Uh, when it comes to the rules of immigration, that law basically reinforced the rules from 1924. What that law, what that law added, added uh, more uh, systematization of the naturalization rules, which were not so clearly codified before. So the racial uh, restrictions were abolished, Asian and blacks were allowed to naturalize, okay, uh, quotas were upheld but uh, limited a little bit, there was the window for the special uh, uh, skilled people, and uh, there was, uh, because of the anti-Soviet sentiment, there was the whole list of people, named, listed by name in the law, who were the told that they are not allowed to come to U.S. and live in the U.S. because they were considered the enemy, ideological enemy, like Pablo Neruda. There were a few Nobel laureates. The future uh, uh, Prime Minister of Canada, Pierre Trudeau, was on the list. So, yeah. so it's nothing to be wrong. Okay, what is very important that, okay, okay, let's see. Uh, that that law was voted uh, voted by President Truman, but overridden by House and in the Senate. And what is 
important, I, uh, you know, I don't know if you can read it, but what Truman basically said, that today we are protecting ourselves as we were in 1924 against being flooded by immigrants from Eastern Europe. This is fantastic. We don't need to be protected against immigrants from these countries. On the contrary, we want to stretch out a helping hand to save those who have managed to flee into West Western Europe, to succor those who are brave enough to escape from barbarism, to, uh, to welcome and restore them against the day when they, uh, their countries will, as we hope, be free again. And this is what is the basically most important part of his statement. These are only a few examples of the absurdity, the cruelty, of carrying over into this year of 1952 the isolationist limitations of our 1924 law. In no other realm of the national life we are so hampered and stolified by the dead hand of the past as we are in this field of immigration. Amendment. This is exactly what is happening today as well. Okay? And Mr. McCarran, who was the senator who was sponsoring the law, his, you know, more pivotal statement was, I believe that, that this nation is in the last hope of Western civilization and this oasis of war shall be overrun, perverted, contaminated and destroyed, then the last flickering light of humanity will be extinguished. I take no, uh, no issue, I mean this is so clear xenophobia that it cannot be, but he gives a little bit of bullshit. I take no issue with those who would prize the contributors which have been made to our society by people of many races, of various creeds and colors. However, we have in the United States today hardcore industrial blacks which have not become integrated into our American way of life, but which on the contrary I I add but on the contrary, are its deadly enemies. Today, as never before, untold millions are storming our gates for admission, and those gates are cracking under the strain. The solution of the problems of Europe and Asia will not come through a transplanting of those problems, problems and mass to the United States. It's basically nothing changed. The same arguments we hear today. So I just want to give you some... Uh, the next move was the Immigration Act of 1965. Probably some of you may remember that. What the reason for that was that those were the times of that you know, uh, liberation movement, uh, human rights movement, and it was obvious that the immigration <laughs> law didn't stand to the time. So there was the pressure that something needs to be done. Well, basically what was done was the cosmetic changes. They abolished the national, uh, so there was no change of concept, so they were arranging the methods. They abolished those national origin formulas, but they replaced them with the preference system based on the family relationship with citizens of the United States but still quotas, national quotas were upheld, okay? Immigration, and this is something which was, immigration was basically defined as a gift that the richest country on earth is graciously giving to the lucky few among the poor. This is basically what was the concept behind that. We are so rich, okay, so we can afford to give this few thousand here, few thousand there. Let those people come and enjoy, okay? So this is, so quotas were uh, upheld, but there were uh, uh, no ethnic restrictions. There were uh, some additional quotas for the uh, special skills and immediate relatives, okay? Consequences. This was the time when the window was open to the uh, chain of family sponsor the, the uh, chain of family sponsored immigration. Okay, what are we talking about? As all the racial uh, limitations were lifted, suddenly Asians, Asians start coming in big numbers. The whole concept of that law was 
built in complete disassociation from the economy. It has nothing to do with the economy. It was based that America is such a great country, it is an exclusive club, and we can afford to let few people in. Okay? And that was the, the <laughs> and what's happened? And I'll be I'll be showing you some numbers. Focus on family sponsored immigration attracted legal immigrants depending on welfare. Oh yeah. Big, and uh, I was it was much later, but uh, the poor Jews will come to the picture. But there was uh, uh, in the 90s, but the same rule applied. There was, uh, <coughs> at that time, there was the discussion about the welfare reform, and one of the journalists in some uh, not big uh, city in New York area, mm, but not New York itself, where I think, was trying to find out what is the ethnic group which takes the most in welfare. And we're looking for talking about Puerto Ricans, Mexicans, and so on. When he looked at the numbers, there were the Jews. I mean, something, I mean, those people, they make money. What's happened? That at that time, there was a release on the Soviet Union side, and they let those Jews out. So many of those people came. Well, who came? Mostly young people, you know, energetic. So they set them, themselves up. Five years later, they sent, uh, uh, you know, they invite using that you know, family, mom and pop. And I can tell you, I, I work in certain environments here, and so the jobs, there are the whole housings, mostly in Milwaukee, Chicago less, that are basically retired Russian Jews live. And they all came legally, okay? They came after they retired over there, and most of them, as a matter of fact, were well off over there. They were the uh, bureaucrats, uh, military people, you know, carry military people, and you know, the pensions of it uh, went down the drain. Okay, so instead of you know living over there a crappy life, they come here. They didn't work one day, and they got basically nothing special, just small one bedroom apartment. Okay, uh, and and a small pension, and they can live. Okay, so 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 this is how the system get you know, and and they're not the example. They're not the, you know, the exemptions. Let me say this way. My mom has a very nice arrangement in Poland, and she has very good life. If she has some problem, I'll do the same. Because this is logic. Okay, what's happened? That as that law of 1965 was in complete uh, separation from the economy, and those were the times when the economy was doing, you know, mostly, you know, this uh, halfway decent. So there was no need, and so there was uh, the economy needed more workforce. So what's happened? We start seeing illegal immigration. So by 1986, we had about 2.7 million illegal immigrants who were, by this act, legalized. And the, there's a lot of talk about it, and let me explain that. What happened, that those immigrants were legalized. However, the source for illegal immigration was not eliminated. OK? So basically, the same policy which led to illegal immigration was upheld. Immigration still was held isolated from the needs of the economy. There were arbitrary quotas. So what the government said, well, if people are coming illegally, we have one regulation. This was socialist do. We have one regulation which failed. So what we're going to do? We make one more regulation to fix the regulation which should be basically abolished to begin with. So they added border security. And for the first time in the history of the United States, they forced the employers to check the immigration status. The government was not capable to manage the immigration. 
and the result was illegal immigration. So what government did? Told all the employees, right now, you are the extended hand of the government apparatus, and if Joe comes and wants to work for you, it is your job to verify if that Joe is legally authorized to leave to work in the country. And there were some penalties for that. Okay. And one more time, what was behind it was xenophobia, socialism, and lack of understanding. Okay. And I think. We in xenophobia department. Basically, the concept of U.S. as an exclusive club is still upheld, okay? And for the first time, or maybe for the first time in the modern times, that approach, we against them, was upheld and underlined. <coughs> Socialism. Amnesty means acknowledging the failure of the current policy. And like socialists do, they don't change it. They put more government resources into putting into, uh, to put, put into enforce the failing policy. Like border control, employed, and for all practical reasons, for the first 210 years of the Republic, since 1776 until uh, 1986, the American employer, an American, was free to hire anyone he or she pleases regarding, regardless if that person came from across the street, across the ocean, or across Rio Grande. Since 1986, that freedom of enterprise was taken away from American oh, employees. And uh, that taking away that freedom is unconstitutional. And I talk with the constitutional lawyers. And unfortunately, because of the so called slaughter house precedent from 1873, the long story behind it it will be very hard to win the constitutional case against that uh, 1986 provision. But it's among the constitutional lawyers, it is a full agreement that this is unconstitutional. And the moral meaning of that law is that what it means that the government went into the business of protecting welfare of the least entrepreneurial America at the cost of limiting freedom of enterprise of the most innovative ones. And this is something which we all pay for. And then when we talk about weakness of the uh, deliberative democracy, one more time, nobody took a business-like approach or engineering approach and like to see why we have a problem and what to do. No reflection on the source of illegal immigration. Okay? There was lack of an ability to foresee and foreseeability of employers' mandate. At that time, in 1986, I was in the US already and I ran the business. And I remember that as a businessman, hiring people, I was trying to get the sense how I gonna do it. What what do I need it? And basically, I was given an advice that simply don't worry about. What it is, you just have to have in the drawer the folder with the document which look like that that person is legal. And you don't need to find out if the document is fake or not. Okay? This would be the, somebody's also problem. And this was the approach of the most of the employees. Okay? The other thing, the, the law didn't see inability to protect the borders from illegal crossing. This is simply, if you think about it, how you want to stop people from crossing the border illegally, you would, after a few minutes of thinking about it, you will come with the conclusion that will happen what really happened. That didn't happen. 
the one thing which I am very, you know, amazed about it is the check of the manual approach. Every time when we face as a nation some problem, the in my in my approach, the right <laughs> way is okay. Let's go back to the foundation, to what the founding father intended, and see according to those rules and ideas what would be the right solution. And the founding father said, all men are created equal. Not all Americans are created equal. Okay? And everybody has the freedom and the right to pursue the happiness. Okay? So what are the consequences? Honestly, without fixing the broken uh, uh, legal immigration system, open the channels for illegal immigration driven by the labor market. This was the time when the, you know, all the computerization boom, and there was basically economic uh, growing, and, and simply uh, people were really needed, and everybody uh, had, nobody has, has problems with you know, hiring people who were illegal. <coughs> that law, and I can tell you that from my personal experience, was perceived by potential immigrants as one more, more evidence of irrationality of Ameri <coughs> Americans blindfolded by the xenophobia. This law was so <coughs> illogical that simply for someone looking from outside, not thinking in those categories as politicians in Washington do, said this is so stupid it cannot hold. So simply we behave rational, rationally and either or later the law will collapse on its own way. And it did, okay? Employers perceive that mandate, the government mandate, as an undue government intervention into business. I was an employer, that's how I saw it. And, this, and of course, the, the massive illegal immigration, I mentioned that. And of course, when we have so many illegal immigrants, there are people who hate them. So that's what we are going. <coughs> so, the government tried to do something. One thing was they found out that uh, in 1990 there was some small immigration act which basically ended up in introducing the diversity visa. You know what the diversity visa is? This is so-called a visa lottery. What somebody noticed, and this is you know, when someone who makes a rational observation tells to the government this is how they were interpreted. Somebody noticed that if someone wants to come to the United States legally, okay, let's say I, I live somewhere abroad, one day I wake up, I say my life is crappy, I just want to try it in the United States. There was, and still there is no way for that person to go somewhere, knock to the door to the uh, go American government institutions and give me the paper, I'll fill out, I can wait even 20 years, when my line will come, I want to come. There's no such a document, no such a provision. So, uh, because if you don't have a family who has sponsored you, or you don't have an employer who has sponsored you, there's no way. So somebody said, okay, we will leave the door open for everybody. So they created the visa lottery. So every year or so, people can file some papers and to the government, they make a lottery, and by lottery, they give the visa to some people. As stupid as it is, you know, but that's what they do. They increase a little bit of quotas, they uh, uh, changes the, uh, let homosexuals to come and naturalize. And of course, they recognize that because of the uh, illegal immigration, they need to increase both the security. This was the time they started spending money on the, uh, militarizing the Mexican border. The next act is already tells you what's going on. Illegal immigration reform. Because at that time, illegal immigration was such a big problem that nobody was thinking about reforming immigration. They needed to address illegal immigration because this was the problem. That they caused it to begin with, nobody told about. So they didn't propose any policy change. But they start, they put uh, you know, a lot of effort, whole lot to do with those unintended consequences of the faulty immigration policy. So of course, they, this is the time they put a lot of money on the border security. And they put uh, a, a tougher treatment for the tenant and the <coughs> So there's 
how they can be detained, when, how long they can be kept. All those things were uh, made much tougher. And there was at that time they introduced the 10 year ban for entering USA for someone and staying illegally for one year. So if somebody came, crossed the border, stayed more than one year, and is caught, cannot come. And they made some small petty provisions, like, you know, uh, as there was some uh, business that people were bringing wives uh, as a, you know, a uh, woman to immigrate, so they, uh, you know, put some extra government control over that. And of course, at that time, was this was, you know, female genital mutilation was that uh, uh, in fashion. So they said that the government have to inform every female uh, immigrating from those countries about those rights that she has in the United States. So this is what is how it's important. So then we had the failed attempt of the immigration reform in uh, 2006. I wrote the essay on that, if somebody go on my website. I call it that neither immigration nor reform. That neither immigration pretends to the uh, proposal prepared by the House, and the proposal is called Border Protection, Anti-Terrorism, and Illegal Immigration Control Act of 2005, known as H.R. 4437. Basically, that law is the shame of the, you know, of the legislation body. They didn't change any quota. They basically make illegal immigration a crime. They ask for forceful removal of illegal immigrants, and they ask for making a crime for helping the immigrants. So if, let's say, I gave the shelter to an illegal immigrant, I was, and I don't remember, furious in jail. That law, of course, never passed, okay? The Senate, the Senate, tried to do something better, so they called themselves Comprehensive Immigration Reform Act of 2006. And basically what they offer, they offer some amnesty for some illegal immigrants. They suggested so high fine and increasing some, you know, the, the, the little bit of the quota. Basically there was <coughs> no reform in that one. The family of three needed to pay $10,000 to stay. It's ridiculous. Okay. Somewhere in the middle, you probably heard about the DREAMAC. The DREAMAC is basically, uh, there's some acronym for something I don't even remember, but basically it is for helping naturalize uh, children of illegal immigrant children who came here with parents as children, with no they, you know, will, and if they, you know, made it halfway distant in the country, you know, get to the college, to the army, the, you know, there was the attempt in 2001, as a matter of fact, by Durbin, and the other one, I think, was Ori Hatch from, I think, Wyoming, or Ori Hees, some of the rest. That, you know, let's legalize these people. But the anti-immigration <coughs> atmosphere in the country is so deep that that act never was able to pass. Right now, when the Republicans try to, you know, deal with the current uh, uh, Senate uh, uh, proposal, they contemplate to, you know, uh, <coughs> uh, support that concept. We don't know. We'll see after the lessons what they will come with. <coughs> so we ended up with the present immigration of all concept, okay? And it is called border security, economic opportunity, and immigration, moder uh, immigration modernization act. This is the Senate proposal which passed in Senate, I think, by the end of June. Here you see in the red, F, F, and C minus. This is how I rate in the school the, the value, what they said. So the border security, I rate F, economic opportunity, I rate F, immigration modernization, C minus. Okay, and let's go into the details. First, putting border security up front, and you probably <laughs> follow that at least a little bit, so you know that the border security is a big part of that particular proposal. And this is the, I call it border security BS, because this is border security <laughs> BS, okay? So this is BS in brief, okay? And why? Because we, why we have the problem on the border? Why people cross illegally? For only one reason, because we don't have the immigration law which allows to come to the country as many people as the economy needs, so they come illegally. If we had 
the law which fits the country's needs, nobody will like to come close the border illegally. So otherwise, securing the border first and then reforming immigration, which basically we want to do, is as logically uh, coherent as in during prohibition, we would say, okay, prohibition is bad, we will stop it, but before we will do it, we first have to close all the illegal alcohol production and distribution. After we do that, we will lift the prohibition. Okay? So, so this is a complete piece of nonsense. Uh, this, this law has halfway reasonable attempt to legalize currently and document it. Put a little tough on it, but at least tries to make uh, you know, some, some good in it. So this is where they got C minus, okay? Uh, that law also, as prepared by Congress, finally limits the family sponsored immigration. We don't need the family sponsored immigration. If the couple uh, get married and they want to live together, they don't need to have immigration visa. They can have for five years guest visa and let them leave. After five years, if they leave, everything is fine. Let them get naturalized or legalized, okay? So we don't need, but they cut all those brothers, sisters, cousins, the only uh, spouses, and I think uh, children that would be below certain age. Finally, they get off, get out also, get rid of their diversity, visa lodger. They offer a little bit of expansion of the non-immigrant work visas. So they finally recognize that many people want to come and work, and if it works for them, they may stay. If not, they may go back. But this is the quotas which they offer, they are basically laughing. Okay? And those quotas are still arbitrary. They are not based on any economic mechanism. So otherwise, except the one year when we have economy, you know, boom, we may need twice as many immigrants as the last year. And simply, this is, you know, central planning. I lived in Poland during the socialism. This is how they did it. This is the, the reason they collapsed. The central planning. And they, of course, do expansion of E-Verify. And I call the whole proposal Rube Goldberg style solution. It's so complicated <laughs> that Rube Goldberg will be <coughs> proud of it. Okay? Yeah. I'm bringing you one more time. We'll be talking a little for the last few minutes about the the, uh, the numbers. So one more time, this is the uh, uh, chart which I had before, which tells us in uh, absolute numbers how many immigrants enter the country. And we see that the numbers are going down a little bit for the last few years. The last year is 2012, because basically of the economy, uh, of the depression. So simply, there's nothing going on, and uh, uh, we have fewer immigrants, OK? This is the one more time, this is the same by uh, immigrants, by the number of people living in the country at the given year. Okay, and then we go to a little bit interesting stuff. This is also from one of the government publications. This is uh, the chart that we don't have it for the last year, but it changed a little bit. So it is what percentage of the population were the people foreign born? So by the end of the 19th century, and the beginning of the 20th century, on the peak of the great immigration period, about 14.8 14, 14 was the top. So between 13 and almost 15 percent of the population living in the country were the people who were born in the foreign country. Then the number went down, and right now it's approaching about 13 percent is in 2012, 2000. Okay. What is the percentage of the foreign-born population in Canada? I just pulled from St. Canadian publication. So and by the end of 19th century, it was also about 15, 16, 13, 23. By the beginning of the 20th century, it was 22. And by the 2006, it was 19.8. By 2012, it's 20%. For your reference, the other country, like Australia, has the foreign-born population 26%. So if we go and do a little bit of basic math, okay, Canada 
foreign-born population residents, including illegal immigrants, all of them. This is official number from government sources, 30%. Well, for each hundred people living in the United States, 13 were born abroad. In Canada, it is 20%. They, for all practical reasons, have no illegal immigration. Okay? Then, assuming that the uh, uh, economy of USA and Canada are similar, they are. They are not the same, but they have very many similarities. And the countries have similar history. Okay? So, if we would like to <coughs> have also 20% of the foreign born residents, we should accept additional 22 million of immigrants. 22, it is 20 minus 13, 7 percent from uh, 350 million is 22 million. So simply, and I don't hear any you know complaining in Canada that the Canada is losing, losing its identity or something like that. The other thing which is interesting, population on USA is 350 million, population on Canada is 35. Illegal immigrants in USA are right now 11 million. At least an official number. I know that people question. And illegal immigration in Canada. I had a hard time to find that number, but the best estimate I came out is about 100,000. So otherwise, in US, illegal immigration is about 3.4.9, about 3.5% of the population are illegal immigrants. In Canada, it is about 11 times less. It's less than 0.3%. <coughs> so simply, that is the question. Okay, and I will not answer that question, but we will leave it to the uh, you know the session of the basic. Why we have 11 million of illegal immigrants? Or let's say whatever the number is, I put that question mark because some people claim it's 30 million. Maybe it is 30 million. Why it is 30? It is, but not one. Well, not 100, uh, 11. I mean, when you read the reports from the border, it indicates that people caught crossing the border illegally make multiple attempts. Hence, it is reasonable to assume that almost everyone who wanted to come illegally eventually did. And you know, from the, you know, some uh, data which I don't, I see that. So why only 11 million immigrants? Why not? 100 million, uh, 111 million. Why not 1 billion? I want you to answer me that question. I'm not answering. Who didn't see that movie? Raise a hand. Who don't know what it is? You didn't? Okay. This is, I call the guy the master of deception. Okay. He is the president of the uh, Numbers USA one of the most prominent anti-immigration uh, organization in the world. He has the so-called gumball video. And that video shows and works on the sentiment that America is the wealthy country who gives immigration to some people as a gift. And he says, okay, this is how many people are in Asia, this is how many people in uh, Africa, in South America, and this is America. How many of them can be fed, uh, can fit into that small piece? Okay? So the, he says, we cannot co open the borders because all those people want to come to America right here. Okay? And, and, and we will discuss it because this is some global economy. When we look at the immigration, we have to see what is going on. And you like it or not, Global economy is here, and you better acknowledge it. If anywhere in the world, and this is the part of the global economy, if anywhere in the world there is someone ready to do your job for less, eventually she will get it. And if we will not let immigrants come and do jobs that they are ready to do for less than Americans would, those jobs will go abroad. So otherwise, our choice is, if there is a, let's say, meatpacking plant, and America wants to work for 15 or 20 dollars an hour, or whatever it might be, 25, and there are some Latinos who want to come and work for 10 dollars, or maybe even less, okay? And 
if we say no, we don't let those people come, we wanted those Americans work, that factually like they will all disappear, move to Mexico, or that somebody who was buying meat from that factory will buy meat from Argentina. So those jobs will disappear. The only jobs which will not disappear, will not go away, the jobs like McDonald's, Walmart, Dennis. And then today, when you uh, read the government, I mean the uh, unemployment reports, those are the only jobs which are easy to get. But those are not the jobs which create the middle class. Okay? And if we want to protect American jobs from the competition of foreign, we need to complete, we need to strike basically where the problem is. And the problem is globalization. So we need to separate ourselves from the rest of the world. We have to, I mean, let me say this way. I have a close friend who works for Deere. Everybody knows Deere, those uh, machines, in the R&D department. So they had about you know a few hundred engineers doing, uh, he does some electronic automatization for them. So they had a few hundred engineers working on it. Right now there's only about 20, and they do some outline what needs to be done. They send over the internet to India, they come back next day morning, it's done. So simply, if you want to protect American jobs, cut uh, international phone lines, cut internet connection, basically delegalize the trade with China, cut e internet connection with India completely tomorrow, this is the way, and have made government to give you the, every time, the special permit when you want to go abroad, make sure that you don't, you know, betray American jobs. So then, let's look at the, I'm just finishing the last few slides. Immigration, immigrants as the border, okay? And many people see the immigration that they cause a lot of burden to the society. There was a famous rector report, somebody who wants to read more about it, I wrote the essay, and, uh, 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 you know, explaining his uh, error. Basically, people, uh, there's, there's, you know, one of the lines of conversation that people who are uh, low skills, low pay, they consume more in social services than they pay in taxes. Mostly people with very low income pay no taxes. The problem is also the what? Also, those who make a lot don't pay taxes. <laughs> what? Okay. Well, the problem is that simply. A, okay, I'll explain it later. Then there, there is that also there's, you know, that probably all of you heard the term anchor babies, that the children of illegal immigrants, they basically sneak into the country because they were born here to illegal immigrants and they become uh, 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 citizens. What my approach is that in today's world, when China will be soon having uh, labor shortages, when the birth rate in Mexico is going down, we basically should kiss our butts that they do it because we still this babies. We got new Americans born here, which we can educate them the way we want to raise them, and we will not we will need fewer immigrants later. So simply, this is that you have to see the light. Most uh, uh, when we talk about the immigration. Uh, there's quite often an argument, oh, big business wants immigrants because they got cheap labor. Well, this is not the issue of the immigration. This is the same as here as the issue of the income distribution. If you don't like big business making money, don't blame immigrants. Just tell straightforward that you want to cut the income of the big business. And then this, this will, so, so this is, so immigration is just the tool. When more people work, and this is very important, I want you to understand that part. When more people work for less, so that means we have uh, more low paid people. When more people work for less, more wealth is created. And that wealth stays here. So simply, if you don't, if you don't like it, you can do it two ways. You can say simply, we don't let those people work for less, and that world will be world will be not created. Or you can say welcome, and you can hope that when that world is created, 
And maybe not you will be the one who gets I'm finishing with a few minutes. Immigrants as the source of problems all we have. Labor shortages. The construction is one example that people believe that the uh, immigrants cause you know, the uh, labor. Well, there were times that it took the crew of, uh, big crew of, of carpenters few weeks to build the house frame. Right now the house are prepared in the factory and uh, on the job site it takes just you know, a few people to build the, the, the construction, the, to build the, the frame. And that person who hopes that might be an immigrant, but those carpenters don't lose the job because of commoditization. The, the software engineers will believe that they have to create whatever they have. Right now, there are millions of software engineers in India willing to work for less. This is not the problem of, of immigration. Healthcare, education, and girls and the population, the same. All the problems which we have, immigration just underlines and shows them. Okay, we are close. What needs to be done in order to have a working immigration policy? After I explain you what is the, what the, what the problems are, there is I align few things which needs to be done. What what is the first and most important thing which needs to be done in order to make the immigration policy work? Anybody wants to take amnesty? <laughs> Government control. Yeah, okay. What needs to be done, we need to take away the value from the right to work and work here. Okay, out of that, my analysis of immigration, I came out with the concept of the Freedom of Migration Act, which I have the website and whatever. And basically, I believe that the only way for people to come and settle here should be by finding the job. You come here, I don't care how you came. If you find the job, you go to the government, you say, okay, listen, I found the job, give me the papers. They give you the papers, you can work for five years. After five years, if you are in good order, you go to the next agency, say, okay, give me the green card. End of the story. If you want to leave Ilya, fine. We don't need the family sponsor of immigration. We don't need uh, <coughs> anything else. The other exemption would be, you know, uh, refugees and so on, but this is a small thing. If we go with that uh, freedom of migration, I did some calculations, it's a little running out of time, I will, in the debate I will bring you on the spreadsheet. I, uh, I uh, estimate that if we will go the immigration, as I say, the yearly arrival of, of foreigners who will come and work here will be anywhere between about 900,000 and 25, 2.5 million, when right now only 1 million arrive. And summarizing the 100 years of the immigration <coughs> policy in the USA. Nonsense, even if supported by majority of Americans, even if voted in by the post chambers of commerce, even if signing into law by president, is still no support. I think that I'm done. Right now, the questions? Yes, um, we'll, we'll take questions. Brown will be doing the question and answer period, but I'll help you on the way going. Uh, let's just start with. Jean, go ahead and start your first question. Yeah, yeah I, I noticed that there were certain years in there where there was very low immigration. In your research, did you find that there were any years, perhaps in the Depression, when more people left the country than came into the country? Yes. For example, Great Depression, uh, it was... Okay. Okay, for example, Great Oh, why did you take it? I it's still on the show. <laughs> it's okay. For example, Great Depression was the period when, uh, uh, after the law was introduced and after the uh, uh, Great Depression was the, the, the collapse, and there were for a few years more people left. There was similar during the uh, Civil War. And then when you look at the chart, well, sorry, if you just took it, in the 19th century, when there was the freedom of movement, so you see there were years so it go up and down. Because basically what was going on over there, people were coming mostly for work. 
So people heard, okay, I heard there's some work over there. They went over there. Well, the worst work they stayed. There was no work. They went back home and came three years later. Thank you. Okay, Brahma is coming up. Let's take your question real quick, and then Brahma will take yes, over. Yes, Jess. Sure. Th thank you for the for the presentation. One of your one of the slides near the end it showed that in Canada the foreign-born population uh, today is approximately twenty percent. It's exactly one percent. Twenty percent, and then oh, it's okay. You need to film me. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> And then the the U.S. of A. It's approximately thir right now 13. thirteen percent. How, what are the most salient differences between the immigration policies in Canada and the U.S. of A. that that allow for there to be twenty percent foreign-born population and less than one third uh, of a percentage? I have to be honest. I don't know exactly the all the integrated details of the policy. I know the parameters, and basically, what they have, they have an immigration policy that people have the way to get connected with the employers who look for work and then simply they go through the process. So uh, it is uh, something similar to what I suggest like the Freedom of Migration Act, but basically what they do that uh, uh, they have certain registries of, of need for, for workers and you as a foreigner can go to the Canadian consulate and say, okay, this is who I am, this is what I can do, I want to go to Canada. And they say, okay, you know what? In Calgary, there is the company who may want to hire. Okay, and this is so, so this way, they have very close match. So people don't come in chaos, they come, they already come, and they are set. And this way, that illegal immigration is basically kind of left over, loose end of the whole process. May I ask one yeah. clarifying question? I, I promise to keep it short. All right. So, so in the states, you talked about the employer mandate. I know that in the states, employers before they'll, before the a visa, a sponsorship visa we approve, employers have to prove that that no American could be found to do the job. Is that not the case in Canada? That there's that those provisions aren't in place to try to protect domestic jobs or people already here. Honestly, I don't know exactly the the, the, the procedure. I know one thing that there's much easier to get there, the, the association with the jobs, that's how they find people, okay? And that they <coughs> let people in on you know, bigger numbers, and they ended up with the 20% of the population. Thank you. All right, Charles? Yeah, Henry, looking over your, your Freedom of Migration Act, it seems like you would allow the importation of slaves and the employment of children, because it's an absolute right, you say, of the employer. They can hire whoever they want. Okay. Where did you get that? Okay. There were no laws until 1986 on the right to hire. Okay. Let me, is anyone here in the group who owns the business and has employees? What is anyone talking? in the group here, in the in the in the in the, in the hall, who owns the business and has employees? You do. Okay. Okay. Let me ask you this way: If you want to employ someone, would you like to employ the alcoholic? Would I like to employ who? Alcoholic. An alcoholic. An alcoholic. An alcoholic. Uh, no. Okay. Drug users. No. Get a gang member. A gang member. No. Yeah. No. Terrorist. No. Okay. <laughs> so this is, you have it. An example. Copy, right? Okay. If copy. will you throw the nation everywhere. Yeah. Right. What is your name, sir? David Travis. Mr. Travis. Can we trust Mr. Travis? No. 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 Absolutely no. not. No. <laughs> you got the wrong guy. <laughs> because what, 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 what I know as an employer myself, right I, I, now I, I don't employ people, but I did in the past. I know that simply if somebody who I want to hire, I want to screen this person to be a good morals, hardworking, dependable, because my money are in stake. So if I'm hiring someone, and if for whatever the reason I don't want to hire Neuber living next door, I want to hire someone, let's say, from Latin America, because let's say that person may want to work for less, and it is important to me, because I want to sell 
my product all over the world. I have to compete with people who can hire that other person. So simply, I don't want to hire anyone who is socially not adjustable. Or black. No. <laughs> if the, or Polish. I care or only if that person can do the job, can come on the time uh, to work at the time, finish the work, be dependable, be loyal, be honest. And this is, so otherwise, none of the government regulations can create the system which will be so dependable and so well tuned to select the best people which we can get. Then Mr. Travis, when he will be selecting people which he employs. No, his, his brother-in-law. <laughs> Okay, David. But that still doesn't answer Charlie's question, so I'll ask it. Okay, go ahead. Um, where it is, on what bait, on um, question is, you again did not show, or let me try this again. You and your answer to Charlie's question, you didn't say, um, you didn't, I'm getting lost here. All right, let's try. Charlie asked you, or said to you, that under what you showed, it looked like that you could hire a slave, bring slaves into this country, or what was the other thing that you the asked? Children. Child, children. Labor. Okay. Child labor. Okay, let's meet. And you didn't address those concerns. Okay. Can I address Go ahead. Yes. Okay. That on which ground you believe that me as an employer, or Mr. Travis, Okay, who established the slave labor because I'm hiring someone who came from abroad. Domestic help. Well, uh, the same laws which will apply for me hiring an American will apply for me hiring a foreigner. So simply, if I want to break a law, I don't need to hire the foreigner. I can hire an American and break the law as well. Okay? That assumption of what, I understand what the child is talking about. The assumption is, and his mistake is based on that in his mind, we still have the illegal immigrant population because those people are easy to be exploited because those people live in the shadows and they have no rights for all practical reasons. So simply, if I find the illegal uh, person in the country who I, uh, let's say, offer the job, and that person, let's say, has very limited options to do the work, and if I decided to underpay that person and you know overutilize, and that person, in order to survive, would need to take my offer, then this is correct. I will be basically created this label. If I can go away, I can hire a child, okay? But what, what is going on, that this will, is illegal in the country. So I will be yep. breaking the basic labor laws, but because of that person being illegal, that person will be afraid to raise their hand and say, well, this is illegal. But if that person will be working legally, the first day, I may go away. My first week, I may go away. The next month, I'll be in jail. Point. <coughs> it's a good point that when people don't have recourse to the law, that creates an opportunity. Of course. For and if I'm, I'm not people. honest, I can take advantage of it. And some people do. <laughs> All right, next question. I have one more. <laughs> All right, Jesse. <laughs> so it's, it's interesting. I like your example that a, a small business owner, for example, the characteristics that the person's going to look for would be show up to work on time, not a drug user, not an alcoholic. And that's, I would say, yeah, that's definitely true for for small business owners that we could self-regulate, we could self-police ourselves. It's, with the large companies, though, what we see are large companies knowingly buying their products from factories where people are enslaved and children are working. You know, po pollute the environment in China, pollute the environment in Thailand because it's illegal here. So it's, I don't think that large companies would self I know they wouldn't self-regulate because that's, it's currently illegal and they do it anyway. 
Yeah, the, the no rules I don't think would work. I mean, this, let me say this one. Uh, the other issue which, which people brought in there that is the issue of taxes, okay? Well, those illegal don't pay taxes, okay? Some may not, some do, because the government established that basically tax number. But what the problem is, the problem is not immigration. The problem is your distrust in the capital. Basically, you distrust that the capitalist, someone who has the factory that is dishonest. And if I'm not honest, and I'm a capitalist, I have millions of ways and, uh, and, and, and you know, methods to screw up the system. Yeah. I will, you know, put some shitty stuff in your foot. I will sell you, you know, under, you know, not function, well working, you know, machines and whatever. And we have the whole government, you know, uh, monitoring system, you know, standards and whatever. So simply, immigration is nothing different in that aspect. And people go to jail, okay? Because they, you know, are not honest businessmen, okay? So simply, this will be just one of those. And people will try, like they try to do with other stuff, okay? So, so simply, the issue is not immigration. The issue that you just see immigration as a special case that those capitalists which you don't like may try to screw you. It's a good, if someone's going to break the law, they're going to break the law. Yeah, and I don't need that. I can break on any occasion. All right, Tim? How do you then uh, take care of, like, the bankers at Wall Street? Things like that, how, you know, you're saying that most people are going to obey the law as a matter of recourse, and that there are a few that break the law. Well, how do you enforce it then across the board? Because we, we all know of some of the big banks getting away with some really shady and illegal practices on Wall Street. Well, I, mean, I don't know how this relates to the immigration. Uh, I'm not the expert, expert on the banking. I can tell you one thing in, in, in my, you know, because I was writing a little bit on that issue as well, mm -hmm. uh, that what, we, what the question which you asked is related to the term which we use a collusive capitalism. Okay. So otherwise, if I'm in the big business, okay, my influence is so entangled with the government that simply I, this is how basically the housing market happened. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> they were so deeply entangled with the government regulations that basically they knew that if they screw it up, the government will, let them, will not let them pay for it, the government will pay, okay? Mm -hmm. So, but, 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 but simply, you know, this is the problem of our system. This is basically the subject for the other debate. Okay. All right, Charles? Yeah, looking at your proposal, commercial agencies will run immigration, and the only way to get in is by having a job. So if there's a strike against, let's say UPS is thinking of going on strike, the commercial agencies running immigration could bring in a million strike breakers to replace the strikers at UPS since the companies run immigration? Well, this is basically up to the debate. Because it's up, you're turning immigration over to the company well, okay, so they well, can import, replace one million UPS drivers. We have them speak here with one million who knows where. You well, Working for 10 cents a day. Yeah, and, and let me say this way. Uh, just by by accident, I know about the case Why like that. Why do want that? Well, okay, the point is very simple. Because of the global economy. If for whatever the reason, and this is what I said here. We want to work for 10 cents a day? No, you don't want to work for the 10 cents a day. So your but plan would result in that. No, because what, what this country gives you, okay, and you have to, uh, maybe I didn't state it, this country gives you the best opportunities ever to be a millionaire. Yep. And if you are not one, don't blame those who did it. And so what, what I'm saying, that too many people didn't put an effort to fine tune the skills to keep up to date that with the changing working uh, uh, labor market, mm -hmm. 
they don't have a skills on hand that if you lose your job, you have enough skills on hand that you can get other job which is right now desired so you can get paid better. And the commodization of the jobs unfortunately happens. So otherwise, if for whatever the reason, there will be more people working for less as a driver for the UPS, you have to get prepared that it, you may lose your job because there will be somebody willing to work for less. And the 10 cents per hour is, is the demagogy, it is the demagogy because what, what is going on, that if, let's say, the foreigner who lives in Bangladesh and lives on one dollar a day, so we say, okay, we will tell him we pay you five dollars an hour and he will be happy, okay, for one day. Because tomorrow he will go to Jewel and we need to buy food. And he pays for food as much as you do. For, for, for bus, pays as much as you do. So otherwise, his living expenses will be lower than yours because he will live humble for a while. But after the first few months, he will try to get your living standard. He will be not happy being paid half of what you get paid for your job or whoever else. So otherwise, that 10 cents per hour is the typical anti-immigration demagogy, which you know people repeat. Because whoever comes here and wants to stay, they don't want to leave here in the misery they left in Bangladesh. <coughs> they have seen America in the movie, and they want your living stuff. Thank you. I didn't ever realize hiring at strike breakers was to our union benefit. <laughs> Ultimately beneficial for everyone. <laughs> if there are no further questions, nope. we'll move <laughs> to the rebuttal. Period. Let's thank our speaker. Thank you. Hi. 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 It's not just immigration, you've got taxation, like the whole organization of capitalism, socialism, government reg other government regulations. Like it's and now, we have three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, How many more would like to speak? It's open. It's an open forum. You've got to change it. Yeah, speak cool. your mind if you'd like to up there and say something. Uh, Tim, no. can you time them, please? Um, yes. Uh, how much? Right. Uh, four to five minutes each, maybe? Five minutes each. Okay. okay. And okay. Uh, speak loudly so we can all hear you. When you get ready, let's skip it. Uh, Joe, Joe Meyer. Mayor. Uh, In addition to the xenophobia that exists among Americans toward anyone who comes into the United States, there is an internal ethnophobia. Yes. And I cite uh, my paternal grandparents as a case. Uh, my paternal grandfather was a violin teacher in Kentucky. And he moved to Missouri and learned to be a machinist. Uh, he moved into the German community in uh, Springfield, Missouri. Uh, there was also an Irish community in uh, Springfield, Missouri, where he met his wife, my grandmother. Uh, she, her name was Kennedy, and she was descended from John Marshall, from John Marshall, the second Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. Now, they were both Catholics. And the priests, the pastors of each of these churches, the German church and the Irish church, met and agreed that they would not sanction any marriage between a German and an Irish person. <laughs> and they were so-called Catholics. Yes. Right. Wow. Now, regarding the global economy, uh, I feel that unions have fallen down on the job probably since uh, the 1880s. Uh, but more, more, more recently in, in, uh, in the unionization of the American workforce, uh, we've known for some time that uh, American 
capitalists will send jobs overseas, uh, whether it be a professional engineering or scientific job or low-wage uh, grunt workers like I was. Uh, the problem for us now, if we wish to keep American jobs in America, is to send organizers to the countries to organize the workers to, to form unions, demand higher wages, better working conditions. That is the only way we can protect American jobs, if we want to do that. So I disagree with Henrik on that. Now, I, I was a consultant for a, a, a large company, had 19 factories throughout the United States. There was one here in Chicago that I worked for. Uh, it was Sweetheart Cup Company. They made paper cups, plates, straws, all those things. Uh, there was a union in the place that had negotiated a contract with the company to pay the workers two cents per hour more than the minimum wage at that time. It was a corrupt union, obviously. Uh, but nonetheless, the, uh, the, the uh, president of this organization here in Chicago uh, <coughs> would hire people, but he didn't trust anyone, no one. So he would hire uh, uh, people from the ghetto or low-wage people, uh, and he would put them through a grueling uh, process, a lie detector test, $500. This goes back into the 19, late 60s. Uh, and he would have an interview. He had professional interviewers. Uh, who he paid great uh, wages to in order to make sure that none of them had a criminal uh, background and that they were reliable, would come to work every day. And if they passed all of that, uh, he would hire them. And uh, they'd come to work enthusiastic and they would work for the first week and they would never be seen again. They would be gone. The company had wasted all of that money the lie detector test, the interviews, and so forth. Uh, when I came on the scene, I offered a solution to the company. I looked at the people they hired and said, they have borrowed money from the, all of their relatives so they could get to work. They probably came without lunch, but they, they borrowed money. The second week, nobody would give them any more money because those folks were broke. So I suggested, and this has been met with incredible resistance. You hire them without the, the lie detector test or the interviews, the extensive interviews. You give them a week's wages in advance, and you give them a package of CTA tokens. And uh, the president went crazy. He said, they'll, ne they'll take the money and they'll never come back. I said, they're not going to come back anyhow. So he, he took a chance, and he did. And that ended the enormous turnover that the company had. And he, he didn't like the idea uh, even at that, but he accepted it. Um. <laughs> you know, one thing that hasn't been mentioned, at least I didn't hear it mentioned, is that money is sacred and it seems everything the government has done has been to undermine the power of money. I ordered a hamburger in here tonight. I said I didn't want a bun. I wanted it with onions, uh, um, crispy onions. I got a hamburger without a bun and I got it with a couple of strips of bacon on it and some cheese. I had to take it back and tell them that that wasn't what I want. Of course, they. I told them, don't give me that same one doctored up. But they did. They doctored it up and gave me the same thing. And they thought they got away with something. I had to inform the cook that uh, he may have had his fun tonight, but if they ever do that again, that I not only won't eat it, I won't pay for it. That's all. My money is sacred. My money has power. And I'll insist on that, on that power. And so, if a company hires somebody, they're hired, it's a contract, it's an agreement between the company 
and it's someone they're hiring. And so if the guy comes to work and he's half asleep because he sat up all night watching television, they've got a right to say, hey, I didn't pay for this. Get out of here. If the guy comes to work drunk, the company has a right to say, I'm sorry that you're not abiding by the terms of our agreement. You'll have to go. If I hire a man to do a job, I want him to do the job and I want him to do it right. <coughs> and if he doesn't do it right, if he screws up, then I have a right to say, well, I don't want you. You're not, this isn't what I paid for. Today, with all the unions and all of the government involvement and so on, so very many people think, I can do whatever I want, I can screw up all I want, and there isn't a damn thing they can do about it. And, to a large extent, they're right. They've got the government behind of them, they've got the unions behind of them, and that's what has brought this government to its knees. That is what has brought this economy to its knees. We have a... Charlie, do you want to let me talk, or do you want to take a vote? I didn't say a huh? word. I okay, didn't then say just, one just word. pipe that. No, you just make your moans and groans. <laughs> yeah, uh, nonsense. Okay, are you finished now? Yes. Thank you. Uh, as I was saying, <laughs> that's what has brought this economy to its knees. The, the um, socialist programs that the government has put in, <coughs> Uh, I'd, I'd like to very much thank Mr. Heinrich, uh, Henrik uh, uh, Kowalczyk. Uh, he gave a brilliant talk today. He really has my uh, appreciation on this. And, um, uh, and he seems to have a very good understanding of capitalism. And incidentally, uh, we may have had a... Um, we may have a world economy, as he says today, but we had a world economy 225 years ago. Everyone paid with gold. Gold was the, the money that was accepted all over the world. And so if wherever you went, if you had the gold to buy it, you got it. it if you were here in America, you wanted to buy coffee from Bolivia, as long as you had the money, you bought it. So w then we get a Federal Reserve that gives us their artificial money and, uh, and an income tax, which tells us now you've got to use our money and you've got to pay a tax on it, and this and that and the other thing. And that's also what has uh, brought the economy to its knees and given us horrible inflation. Ladies and gentlemen, that's all I've got to say. I would like to thank our speaker for certainly a provocative presentation. I agree with a good part of it, at least the history part. Okay, louder. I agree a good, with a good deal of it, especially the history part, and his condemnation of the xenophobia, which is characterize so much of our immigration policy. But I've heard the word socialism, I've heard the word socialism used too often as a whipping boy for uh, all kinds of blunders and mistakes. I've heard government also used as a whipping boy for, uh, for the blunders and mistakes of the American people generally and of uh, other, other powers that be in the world. I don't think it's, I don't think it, the government is necessarily responsible for all or even most of our problems. Nor, and, I, and while I'm not necessarily an admirer of socialism per se, many of their individual ideas such as the uh, introduction of the eight hour day and the end of child labor have, have improved the living standards of Americans and not destroyed it. And so I'm sorry, I'm unable to join the libertarian and conservative march against socialism and especially uh, against I'm especially unable to join in join the march against condemnation of government simply for being government and for trying to do its job of improving the living and life living standards and lifestyles of Americans thank you
I want to thank the speaker too. Uh, however, I'm listening, and he seems to, he did his best job in covering the history of uh, uh, immigration and government relation and regulation as it relates to Im uh, immigration. Now, let me say I'm pro immigration, legal or illegal. I'm pro. That's not the problem. If it is, it's very minute. Uh, reading uh, the Old Testament, even the classics, and a little history, uh, immigration uh, is old as man. And people have been leaving this place to go to that place ever since the beginning of time. And in most time, in, back in those days, uh, you didn't need passports and all of that and stuff. In fact, the owner of that country was glad to see you. Now, let's get back here to the United States. And let's uh, think about the everyday uh, disinformation, misinformation, and the distraction that somebody wants to use in order to have us looking this way while I say be doing something that way. Now, immigration in America, and, and I'm thinking about the level of mission they claim illegally here. Now, it's all, and it's being used like they use all other kind of shit in order to, the division here, division there, look over here while some going this. If the government didn't want the illegals here, they wouldn't be here. Business want them here. Government want them here. And the guy that served hamburgers, uh, the toilet paper want them here. And if you look at the truth, illegals, our legal, is no threat to us, the population. What is a threat to us, the population? And I've said this because it seems that the speech and we talk about immigration, we talk about jobs, economic comes in, finance comes in. Therefore, we, the masses, is losing because of the policy of immigration and illegal and so forth and so on. Well, I don't buy that. And I can't buy it and have a good country. I might have been like uh, St. Paul said, when I was a child, I thought as a child, and, 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 and I did I ain't no longer a child. And like the blind guy said, I once was blind, but now I see. But people, please, there's enough evidence out there that Stevie Wonder can see it. <laughs> Illegal immigration and that other little bullshit that they teach push it on you through newspaper and Fox News is all a bunch of crap. Your real enemy, and evidence ain't some shit I'm making up, the real enemy is the, the one percenters, the financial whiz on Wall Street, the Federal Reserve, Bernanke and Summers, and all the collusion that go there. Ain't no illegal immigrant, a legal one, ever taking shit from me. These people stole, hijacked my government. I put my money in the bank, I can't get no interest. But they get it. And how did this happen, they say? Well, common sense tells me why it happened. The evidence is so, 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 so visible that Stevie Wonder again could see it. Why should they give me if there's on my money in the bank when they can get that money for nothing? Somebody said, well, what are you talking about? Well, shit, if you're 10 years old, you remember back when they went to the uh, 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 government and said, well, you're going to have to give us some money do we going to fail. And if we fail, everybody in black, black. And sure enough, they have to give them Where do you think the money came from? The money wow. came from our treasure. People, quit letting little shit Get in your way and, 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 and forget about the big stuff. Your government been hijacked right before your eyes. You ain't got no Congress that working for you. They're working for the 1%. You ain't got no rep a senator working for you. They're working uh, uh, regulators in, in the executive branch. All of that been hijacked for the few. And, and, and they said, well, who is this dude here standing up there? Oh, he mad because his uncle was a slave. Or, or they used to have to ride on the back. Man, give me a break, please. The evidence is there. And you're going to take a commercial bank, a, a commercial bank, and you're going to merge it with Wall Street Bank. And they can go and merge with insurance companies. 
people, I remember the, the, the st uh, what class stage of act that they passed back in the 30s, because it was in their book. I didn't write that. Then they said, we write this because we don't want the commercial bank to go out and throw away and create something out of nothing. They're going to have to have reserve, and they're going to lend money for this and that and so forth, and they got to uh, uh, have reserve to back up this and so forth. But now when I'm looking this way and they tell me about the immigrants, I'm looking over here, they didn't merge with the Wall Street criminal. And when they did that, they don't need no reserve. They create money out of nothing. Ain't no immigrant stole my government. Ain't no immigrant done brought the financial world to its knees. It's the one percenters. And if you suffer any kind of economic problem or whatever it is, why don't you jump on them? Because the immigrants ain't did nothing. It's just like in the old days. Immigrants leave because of war. They leave because there ain't no water here, and they go over there because some water over there, and they leave here because a uh, 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 hunger, a uh, war, or whatever it is. That is little stuff. And when the government get it and started throwing around like our government throwing around for the last 20 years, twisting it this way and twisting it that way, when I know that if they didn't want them here, they wouldn't be here. I know that the guy that with the factory and the farm want them, and those are the people that we be concerned about and what they do and not the propaganda that feed us that we're going to have a debate about something. But I'm glad the speaker stuck to the history of it and he wasn't uh, trying to make uh, immigrants favorable or disfavorable and so forth. Thank you. Thank you. In the 1990s, Clinton passed NAFTA, North American Free Trade, so to speak. And in doing this, with Canada and with Mexico, Cargill and Archer Daniels Midlands and other corporations came into Mexico with, with cheaper produce, with cheaper corn and cheaper rice, and they've done the same thing in Haiti. And that way they made tremendous profits. But what happened in Mexico and in Haiti, the small farmers were pushed out of business, and they couldn't make it. And they had to go into the cities. And some couldn't get jobs there, so they tried to get into the United States. So we had immigration. Same thing in Haiti with the rice. They put a lot of uh, rice farmers out of business. <coughs> so uh, some of them came to the United States, but they weren't let in. They were pushed out. So what we have is these free uh, trade agreements that are ruining our economy. We're going all over the world to find cheap labor. It isn't only cheap labor, it's slave labor. Because they produce things very cheaply, the corporations are making tremendous profits out of this. And that's a, they're not creating jobs in the United States because they got the whole world to trade with and to exploit the type of system that we have creates recessions and depressions. And now we have almost a permanent depression. And one day this thing is just going to break apart <coughs> because nobody has the money to buy back the goods because they don't pay them anything. Uh, that's the real problem, not immigration. Well, thanks to the speaker. It was a very interesting talk. Uh, most of the conclusions I didn't agree with. Uh, 
it one would, thing that I do everyone. agree with is the story about the uh, immigrants from uh, Russia. I know a, a bunch of them, and uh, they're all old like me, and uh, they're uh, almost every one of them is Jewish, and almost every one of them is very well educated, and most of them are broke. They're on Social Security, but they almost all got into uh, very nice housing in spite of that. Uh, so it helps to have your kids come over here, I guess. About the Founding Fathers, well, I don't know if I'd want to go back to the Founding Fathers. It's fun to study those guys, but hey, what did they believe in? Well, they believed in what? Slavery! Uh, so I don't know about how their views of labor uh, relate to today. Uh, in 1920, I think, was one of the uh, presidents, I think it was Coolidge, it was probably 22 or 24. I think he said something like, or it might have been in his cabinet. The business of America is business. That was Coolidge. Yeah. Uh, well, whoever it was, I think maybe the speaker feels that way. I'll tell you what, I don't feel that way. <laughs> Canada, yeah, we, if you've been to college a long, long, long time, maybe Charlie remembers this, or Brown perhaps, or, or Jean perhaps, but we had a guy from the uh, Canadian consulate here. It was before 9-11-01. Recollection, now this is a long, long time ago. My memory isn't good. But he pretty much said at that time, hey, uh, if you want to come to Canada, why don't you come? Uh, people are coming from all over. We've got immigrants uh, all over the place. And that's the way we like it. And I guess they still see their country as being empty. Uh, that's another uh, view. I remember being in New Zealand, though, uh, another similar country in some ways. And they said, hey, you want to come to New Zealand? Fine. You got a lot of money? We'd like to have you. Uh, you got a business? We'd like to have you. If you don't fit in those two categories, you can say 60 days and get out. They were a little nicer than that. Final thing that has nothing to do with immigration. I heard somebody speak about the uh, food here and not getting served right and this sort of thing. Well, gee, my, my uh, uh, experience tonight was just the opposite. I wanted uh, salad, uh, uh, tea, and tilapia. Uh, I got my uh, tea and my salad was a little slow in coming, but I didn't care. Hey, I mean, this isn't Lowry's, this isn't, you know, hey, if I felt that was too long, I would have walked over and found the waitress, tell her my uh, salad was late. But anyway, I got a free soup. <laughs> so I was very satisfied. I wonder if this has anything to do with the way I treat the people that work here. Thank you. Uh, I'm Michael Foley. A very long time ago, American Indians were very kind to European immigrants. It didn't work out too well for them. I'm opposed to immigration, all of it. I'm opposed to illegal immigration. I'm opposed to legal immigration, I'm opposed to tourism, student visa, work visa, <laughs> all <laughs> Time to close the door. We got millions of soldiers all over the world, time to bring them back to this country, put them on the border with loaded rifles. If anybody wants to come in here, shoot them. That's all. Shoot them and kill them. I'm done with it. We got 50 states and we got people in all 50 states, and that's the end of it. Nobody else. Now that brings us to Syria. It's been widely reported in the media this week that somebody was detonating poison gas bombs in Syria. <coughs> Our government is very, very close ally of the government of Syria. For the last 12 years we've been sending terrorists from all over the world to Syria to be interrogated. One way or another, our government 
give support and help and aid and assistance to the government of Syria, probably give cash money to. It. It's been widely reported in the media that our government, through the CIA, is very supportive of what's called the rebel army in Syria. We give them weapons, training, money, intelligence, all that stuff. Now, the Syrian government said they didn't detonate any poison gas bombs, and the rebel army said they didn't detonate any poison gas bombs. And they might be right. Maybe the CIA might have hired Blackwater or somebody like that to detonate poison gas bombs. But anything that happens in Syria, no matter what, the United States government, one way or another, is helping and assisting and supporting whoever does what in Syria, no matter what it is. That means that every adult in this country, including me, we help pay for the poison gas bombs that were detonated in Syria this past week. And we help pay the people who detonated those bombs, no matter who they were. That's we, the people in this country, through our tax money, help detonate poison gas bombs in Syria. <coughs> Everybody in this country, every adult, including me, we pay for it. That's all I got to say. Thank you. Well, I thought it was very uh, good speech because uh, it's such, such a complex uh, issue. I immigrated to the United States in 1963. I opened my farm. Louder. I immigrated in 1963 to the States from Latin America. I opened my factory in 1964, and I have it for close to 40 years where I hire and fire people and deal with the business environment in the United States, which is, uh, in my view, what I experienced, very corrupt. Corrupt to the point that it, it just chew itself to the point that we find ourselves today. Uh, the corruption was in the purchasing, in the selling, in the propaganda, in the quality, everything was corrupted, corrupted, corrupted. The government contracting was corrupted. The government co contracting was so corrupted that I sold to the government, to the General Service Administration, or few years I saw products that I was making and when I got my citizenship I have access to the government fairs where you can see what they buy and how much they pay and what I got given to the government they pay me one dollar but actually they pay 20 so actually lost millions of dollars and if you for a small company it was so corrupted that when I called the Justice Department and I said, this is what I see, what's going on in here, the lawyer from Washington, D.C. came to the O'Hare Airport when I picked him up. I brought him to the factory. He looked at my papers and said, hey, yeah, you have a case here. So I would go back to Washington and I would present it in there. So then he said, okay. If you want to proceed, you have to come and live in Washington, D.C. to our requirement whenever we need you for testifying. Say, so, well, can I do it in, what? in Chicago? <coughs> no, you have to come here. So I have my company here, and I will be living down there, right? I said, you don't want me to proceed that, right? Why don't you go and fuck yourself? They didn't want to do anything, the Justice Department. A corruption of millions of dollars in a little shop like mine. Imagine what was going on. Um, a little bit, maybe you hear in the history that there were companies who dedicated to paint buildings. And they, they were, again, every time that they painted a building, a building, it was millions of dollars that they were given away to these companies willy nilly. Um, so we lost the manufacturing, we lost the knowledge that it was involved in manufacturing all kinds of things. Here in Chicago, we used to manufacture aircraft parts, uh, instruments, measuring instruments, uh, telescopes, everything was built here in Chicago. 
and nothing left. Nothing left due to corruption. Not because the workers didn't want to work well, it was corruption. Uh, one of the last companies that I dealt with, they were doing some tool and die uh, things. Tool and die mean molds to inject plastics on or punch press dies that you form metal parts. And what they did is they start getting quotes from Spain and, and other parts. First it was Spain. They send these dies to be made in Spain. They fire the people and they receive the dice and then they sell them with tremendous profit. But they, they let the people, the people who knew how to do them here, they let them go. Oh, then they blame the workers because they don't want to work and they don't trust the company. Will you trust these fuckers? Of course not. But uh, my, my uh, uh, point with immigration was, or, or is as, as far as it goes with this speech today, is that I have in my factory people who came from the farms in Mexico when all this shit went around that they were losing their, their farms and everything. And they didn't know anything about machining or something. And they learned very fast. They learn how to use the micrometers, the measuring instruments. Uh, my best man, my foreman, he when he came to work, he couldn't touch a machine because he was afraid of it. And he became my foreman because he, he learned everything very fast and everything. So immigrants are like any other human being. And in the United States, we have lost our vision of what is to be a human being and treated each other in a decent way. Uh, whoever thinks that uh, discrimination against blacks is, is, is correct, you, you must be blind. And discrimination against the poor, well, you must be blind. You see what the mayor of this city is doing, closing the, the schools in the black neighborhoods, in the poor neighborhoods, and privatizing them so we can extract money from teaching the kids, private schools. This is going down to the bottom of the bottom of all the countries in the world. If you look at a map put by the uh, geophysics, uh, there, is a, there is maps, a series of maps, and they say, what are the countries that use the metric system? There are only two in the world. One is the United States, and no, the other is Samoa. It's a, it's a little right. island. There are the only two countries in the world that use the metric system. What are the countries in the world that don't pay for maternity leave? Maternity leave. United States and Suriname. The two in the world. I'm not talking about communism, socialism, anything, anything. The only two countries don't pay maternity leave. What is the country that don't, don't have laws protecting the worker? Well, <laughs> the only country in the world, the United States, don't protect these workers. Why? Because these have been taken by a bunch of criminals who are being paid by all kinds of corporations to do this and do that. Now, I tell you one last thing for those who are in love with it nuclear shit, the fracking to get gas from the ground, the fracking use liquids that they inject on these deep wells, then they explode them and they fra fracture the, the, the rocks. But when you do that, what you do is you free minerals from those rocks. Well, some of the minerals are radioactive. And the radioactivity that is accumulated in the waters and the liquids that they use for this perforation is higher than the radiation that comes from the nuclear power plants. But they have passed laws already that they are going to dump this radioactive shit in municipal dumps. So it's cheaper for the companies. They don't have to store it on a high level radioactive waste dump. Now, who is governing here? Who is taking care 
of the store. Who is minding the core? A bunch of criminals. Unlike Frank and a lot of the anti-immigration people around yeah, here. Yeah, but you like Tory on reactors, God. Well, it. Frank, that's <laughs> next <laughs> week's topic. And if you want to stop fracking, you'll support thorium. Because yeah, it's, yeah, a, it's, sure, a, it's, sure. it's a different source of power. It's nuclear reinvented <laughs> and revitalized. We haven't had innovations since the 70s. And I agree with you in its present form. Nuclear power is dangerous. But the answer is not shutting it down. It's innovating. And like with immigration, the same thing needs to happen. We now have a globalized economy where we have the freedom of people, I mean, where we have the freedom of goods, we have the freedom of capital. At a touch of a button, I can send a billion dollars over to another foreign country. And with that same press of a button, I can take that same billion dollars back. With the same amount of logistics and transport, I can send goods anywhere in the world and have them all virtually delivered overnight. The problem is, is that what would happen if we had the free movement of people too? I think these United States would have its problems with its employment situation virtually solved. As a matter of fact, I think that the way we treat immigrants now is going to largely have an effect on our economy over the next 20 to 30 years. Because demographics are saying that Americans are aging. The rest of the Western world is aging. The only place you're seeing real population growth right now is in the developing countries in the Middle East. And as we age, we're going to need workers to come back here to our country to take those jobs that we're no longer able to do because of our aging population. Let's face it, when you get prosperous, you don't have kids. Why? Because kids are no longer a source of labor. They're a source of love and compassion, but they're also very expensive to raise. That's why once you achieve a certain level of prosperity, your population evens out. That means that as we age and as we have a shortage of workers, we're going to need immigrants. And if the United States can still hold its assimilation model intact, we won't have to pay for people to come over here. We won't have to pay people to come over here because I really believe that as countries get more prosperous, people don't really want to move. They want to stay in their hometowns, their home countries, and their home places. It's going to take a little bit of incentivization to get people to come over here as the world gets a little bit better. So, you know, right now, we're looking at immigrants as a poo-poo problem that needs to be dealt with through border security. I grant you, within 30 years, We'll be paying people to come over here to work. That's what's ultimately going to solve our immigration problem. Not any change in policy, but a simple change in demographics and demographic reality. You better learn it, because if you do, you're going to have a prosperous future. Thank you. All right. All right, let's thank our speaker again. Thank you very much. Very good. I hope you're keeping notes here. All right, I'm going to be eclectic as usual here. Um, actually, there was a little bit of, I'll give you a little bit, I'm a railroad guy. Uh, one thing I've always found intriguing, um, in, after they built the Transcontinental Railroad in 1869, I each of you should know that they employed the Chinese uh, on the western portion. Amazingly enough, there's no records of any of those Chinese remaining uh, in the United States after it was completed. There's no one who can trace their lineage uh, to having someone uh, who worked on the, that project. They all apparently took their money and left and went back home. But anyhow, a few other things here. I'll be eclectic, jumping around. Uh, you left out in the legislation historically 1917 
is where the thing began. I had a lobby on some of the immigration things he was covered, so I had occasion to research some of this and through presentations here at the college. Uh, the thing he left out in 1917, that legislation is generally regarded as being advanced by the manufacturer, National Association of Manufacturers, to keep those filthy commies out of the United States. And there was nothing else that on his chart that was legitimate. They had one aim and one aim only, uh, to keep commies out of the United States. Obviously, they did not succeed because I'm speaking to you here today. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> One of the groups made from Eastern Europe was the severely restricted quota. They only wanted 344 Lithuanians per year. Actually, that's probably not a bad idea. <laughs> if I was running a country to keep them out. Uh, let's see, we've been over this one though. Uh, I'm sorry, sir, the right to hire is, is not an absolute right. No right is ever exercised in the absolute. Uh, you have the rights of employers, you have rights of employees, and you have rights of organized employees or collective bargaining, and you also have the rights of the government to regulate commerce. Uh, to assert that there's some sort of constitutional right. I'm certain, I'm not a constitutional scholar, but I don't know who you were talking to that told you that cannot be impacted. Uh, certainly there's legislation uh, that, in, in, that, I mean, that affects the right to hire. I mean, obviously, uh, and the right to fire, which has to be done for just cause and not arbitrarily and capriciously. Uh, I mean, much as you like to think the right to hire is, is a wonderful thing, why didn't you get fired like my friend did after, t I remember this, he, he came and stopped by, a guy I'd been working with for years in the private sector, a vendor, and he was let off from work for no other reason. Actually built up the business pretty much, but he was let go because the owner had a brother-in-law who was unemployable and had no, no skills, so my friend found himself looking for a job. Uh, let's see, um, there's some other things there. You gave some examples. I never realized that prohibition was absolute evidence that all government regulation or the right to the government to establish laws they're incapable of doing so or uh, for example is a counter example and certainly the prohibition whether it worked or not there must be thousands of laws that work and work very to our benefit i you know to blanketly say that all legislation is the failure is, is not a supportable premise. Anyhow, um, no, I don't think we're going to abolish all labor laws altogether and turn over the entire economy of this nation and this world to the corporate companies that you're advancing here. Uh, no, that's, that isn't going to happen. I think if you enacted Henry's proposals, you're going to end up with a situation much like we had right here in this country, in this city, around the turn of the century, which these companies, especially the packing companies, were using immigration to keep working conditions intolerable and wages at absolute minimum. And that's why you ended up with the book, The Jungle, was actually a book about not meat packing, yeah. the sanitary conditions, it was a book about how the companies were using immigration one wave after another <coughs> to compete ethnic groups against each other and to keep the working conditions virtually impossible and tolerable and wages at an absolute minimum. 
Now, to say that your solution, I think, is going to be a return to that, I, I, that's historical evidence that maybe it's something we ought to stop a minute and say, well, I don't know if this is what we want to do. I don't think we should use immigration, allow the capitalist, fascist, Wall Street money mongers to be able to use immigration for the purpose of pure exploitation for their own personal gain. That's what you, mean. you have to stop that from happening here. Why, uh, that's like the, uh, from the often talk about. I said this before, like Brother Joe said, why don't we put why don't we put companies on boats and move them to the poorest country that eliminate all of this? You know, we'll save a lot of time. You could sail from here to there or whatever. You know. Anyhow, um, let's see. Um, I got some here. I can't remember what I was going to talk about. But anyhow, the last question I have. We've got to become, why, why is it that um, companies can move <laughs> from country to country whenever they feel like it, but the employees cannot? I mean, why don't we have legislation that restricts what companies can trade in and when they can move or restrict their trade? I'm that, not, if you go on to the, if you look at this WTO stuff, you know that's the one thing they really dislike. Now, why would they dislike it? Because obviously it, it means somebody's going to gain as a result of some check on their system and to our benefit here. Uh, and simply, if you're using the term the greatest good for the greatest number, uh, I think, like, like Frank is saying, you know, turning it over to these corrupt individuals who are motivated by it, they're not doing anything for your benefit. There's absolutely, they're doing absolutely nothing. I don't care what they say. These guys who hire and fire people on something, they are not doing anything for you. They are doing it for themselves. The only reason you hire somebody, quite frankly, for the most part in this world, some guy hires you in order to make himself rich through your labor. He is not a social service relationship. Yeah. This is strictly a thing. That's what, and they want to control it. And there's no other reason. Now, if you have to examine the relationships, it is a <coughs> fundamental unit. It's a lopsided relationship to be in with. And to say that it's for you, somehow you may gain out of it, you, is, is, is not the way it's set up. It's not from the get up and go. Anyhow, thanks a lot. You gave us a lot to kick around here. Okay. Hey, how you doing? Oh, it's good that uh, uh, Charlie at least uh, read about the stockyards. Uh, and it's not limited to the stockyards, you know. It's the, uh, the situation where the uh, great peacock in oh that's right we don't have a microphone all right <laughs> tell us about what would you who would Jesus hire <laughs> whom would I fire <laughs> Jesus hire <laughs> whom would <laughs> Jesus hire well actually he was on Jesus. Wasn't uh, in the hiring and firing business, but if he were, he would hire uh, them. When it got to uh, who was going to follow him, he told them that you know he didn't have much to offer. There wasn't uh, any uh, place uh, for him to lay his head. Uh, he didn't have a house for them. He didn't have a place. For them to reside, uh, he didn't have uh, meals to offer and so on. But he told them, if you go out there and serve the public, the <coughs> people who need you, they will take care of you. And if you're working out of love, 
They're going to take care of it. So you're not going to carry a purse. You're not going to have two tunics uh, one to keep warm because they're going to put you up. And you're not going to have a staff of office or a script uh, that, you know, you're going to quote scripture because what you've got is yourself and you're caring. Well, when it comes to uh, ethnophobia or, or uh, xenophobia, I remember the story of the Polish National Catholic Church in the United States. Uh, well, it started here in the United States. Why? Because the uh, Roman Catholic Church in the United States was overwhelmingly Irish. At least the clergy were. And they didn't want any Polish bishops. And they certainly didn't want the Poles to sing Polish songs in church because there was there were only two languages to be spoken in uh, American churches, as far as they were concerned. Holy Latin and English. Even though they may have had a, a Gaelic background <laughs> themselves, they believed that God spoke Latin and English. <laughs> and not Polish. And when Polish priests published papers in Polish, they excommunicated them. It makes sense. Yeah. yeah. And so, and anybody who was caught reading one of these Polish papers, oh, they could be excommunicated if they didn't uh, repent. Uh, well, a bit of Polish history. <laughs> Does it still? Okay. Oh, well. And so xenophobia. Xenophobia is class related uh, because the, you know, the priest was of a priestly class. <laughs> and they were very guarded about the control of the church. You know, in church, churches, you know, are very sensitive to social pressures. And, you know, if you, I, I remember, you know, my, my congregation in, in uh, uh, United Methodist Church, uh, it was originally a Swedish church joined into by a Norwegian Methodist Church and a Danish Methodist Church. And they, they got along. They were Americanized. And it was in Evanston, after all, they, you know, oh. decent people in Evanston. And they were all a little middle class. But anyhow, they, they well, that's, <laughs> and now it is Gujarati speaking, which is Indian. <laughs> and, 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 and Hindi. But when they meet together, the Gujarati don't speak the Hindi, and the Hindi don't speak the Gujarati, so they have to speak in English. Uh, but they throw in a few songs uh, in their, their own languages. So. All right. Good. All right. Uh, well, all right. All right. But Your that's only up, xenophobia. So Speaker gets the final word. Uh, Speaker gets the last word. Of socialism is government. And I'm afraid that the socialism he knows is capitalist socialism. Uh, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Space capitalism. Okay. I appreciate everybody's feedback. I noticed that nobody picked up on my question, why we have 11 million of illegal immigrants. 
Not one million, not hundred eleven. What? Why is that? Pardon me? Why is that? What? I was wondering if anybody wanted to ask that. The, the, the answer is very simple. Because the free market, which exists regardless we want it or not, needed that 11 million of people for the economy. They are, there was 12 million about a few years ago they left because the economy is in depression. So otherwise, if we didn't do all that mess with the immigration laws, regulations, border controls, and whatever, let people come freely in and out, there still will be 11 million people. Because this is what the economy needs. Unless the economy will be in better shape and we need more people. This likely would be the case. So this was the answer to that question. Uh, uh, most of the comments I don't see much to disagree with. I forget, I mean, I forgot the, na the name, the first person who spoke. I uh, mentioned that slightly disagree with me when it comes to union organizing and so on. I don't see disagreement. What my point is that every time when three people organize themselves, be it unions, for business, for religion purposes, for science purposes, there's nothing wrong with it. It is wrong when the group of people who organize themselves convince the government that the government in order to protect their particular interests, and I don't care if those are unions or capitalists from the Wall Street, if, if the government, in order to protect that group, because they are for somehow important, because they are unions or they are 1% from the Wall Street, the government have to put the laws which will limit my freedom of organizing or my freedom of enterprise. And this is the problem, okay? Well, then the, there was the... Oh, the second was Travis, because I remember this gentleman. And he mentioned something which I agree, but not to full extent, about the global economy. The economy, you are correct, the economy was global always. But because of the limitation of transportation, and I think Tim addressed it basically your, your, your question perfectly, that 100 years ago, most of the business was conducted locally mm -hmm. because it was hard I mean, totally speaking, you could transfer. Right. Instead of transfer everything, but it was expensive. Mm -hmm. Today, like I said, this is overnight, the engineering work can go back and forth from India. Mm -hmm. Okay? That uh, for the relatively low money, you can have trans uh, transported any product from anywhere in the world within the matter of hours. Plastic shit from China. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And so otherwise, the global economy was always global, but the cost of conducting business on the long distances was mm -hmm. relatively high. It was, you know, cost prohibitive for you to buy. I went to Mayer's. I live in Bolingbrook. They have a Mayer's, a major store. I bought the bread, fresh bread, you know. Guess where it's made? In Canada. Mm -hmm. Okay? Probably they didn't want to hire Mexicans in the, in the, in the bakery. Okay? This is how, how the bread is brought from Canada. Okay? Okay. Uh, somebody was complaining that socialism is for me as a whipping boy. Well, I understand socialism. I lived under it. I studied. Real socialism. Pardon me? Real socialism. I, I have, so otherwise, simply, whatever I said, I stood for. What about American socialism? Uh, there was one gentleman who, okay. I don't remember which one. They were saying about um, that uh, that the government and business wants illegal immigrants and so on. And then later the person was mentioning about that the 1% is the problem, the Wall Street and so on. Uh, I agree to that to that extent that the government uh, approach to illegal immigration is a little bit Silly, I would say is the government is in the position that the government, you, each of us, expect that whatever government does, it helps the economy. Because this is what they are for, okay? But at the same time, 55% of Americans believe that we need to cut down on immigration. As 55% of Americans believe that we need to reduce immigration, legally illegal, okay? So otherwise, most of Americans they want uh, smaller immigration, they want to get those illegal immigrants out. 
But for practical reasons, by doing so, we uh, basically hurt economy. So yep. the government basically is kind of, they don't know what to do. <coughs> okay? So this is what, uh, and when it comes to the 1%, I agree uh, to that extent that whatever problems we have with immigration, yeah. Uh, excuse me, but uh, uh, couldn't we fix the immigration problem simply by putting an end to welfare and then those who come here, they'd be willing to roll up their sleeves and go to work? And, and those who, who uh, uh, I mean, a, a long, long time ago, we had it that way. People came here, they were prepared to go to work. Now people come here and they get on welfare. Compared to the way they live in some other country, it's like they're rich. Yeah. <laughs> this, is, this is a little bit of illusion, but the good that you brought it because many people bring it. Of course, if you read the book by Charles Morey, uh, Coming Apart, and basically it studied for 50 years from 1960 to 2010, the change of white, of population of whites in America. He selected whites only, so he could separate all the racial prejudices and influences. And he found out that about 20% of whites are basically completely underclass. And this changed from few percent about 50 years ago mm -hmm. to 20% right now. And those are the people who, like he says, men don't work. They have no families, okay? They, uh, uh, most of the time, they sleep and watch TV, okay? Live on unemployment, okay, and all of that stuff. And this is basically the side effect of the welfare, okay? So the welfare affecting us the most. And that person on the welfare, when the immigrant comes next door and start working, that person feels that his or her job was taken. Okay? Well, so so uh, when it comes to eliminating welfare, for all practical reasons, immigrants are cut off from the welfare. What they get mostly welfare, they take on health care. But this is not the problem that we have such a screw up health care system. Okay? So simply so 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 this is so this is something that I don't think that cutting welfare will resolve the immigration. What I'm saying, if we allow the free movement, like it was in the 19th century, you want to get the job, come here. Mm -hmm. And then you got into the trouble, get out of here. You have your own country, and you go over there back. And simply, we don't need to be, do anything special. Because simply, you will not get health care, you will not get uh, food, uh, and you know what is the most important. What I said, what the what most important thing which we need to do, we need to take out the value from being here. Right now, for example, one thing which I'm always saying, if we, let's say today, we have those 11 million illegal immigrants. If we today say to all of them, we grant you the right to work, to live and work here. And you can just come and go anytime you please. I bet that about two or three million of these people will leave the country within the next three months. <laughs> they might come back when the economy will, will go back. Because they, after all, the people's dream is not to live on the welfare. People want to have nice houses, so they, with a little bit of money they made here and safe, they will go uh, wherever they came from, and they will have slightly better life than here, you know, asking government for, for, the, for the food coupons. Henry, I thought immigrants, there's about 100 studies that say immigrants produce about 10 times more for the economy than they get in return. All right, we're going to have to cut it off. It's 11 o'clock. Okay. So, yeah. Whatever I want to say. They don't even get Social Security. Sometimes they pay for the system, they can't take it out. Brom, we it's closing well, time. You know, I, think that, I, mean, I can talk about a few things, but I think basically 
Uh, founding fathers, people say that they were believing in slavery. Uh, they gave us the concept of the freedom, okay? And this is something which brought the uh, 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 wealth to the economy. The role of the government. Uh, uh, Charles, I don't agree with you that whatever the legislation the government does is bad. What I believe is the issue is Thank what you, the government will be doing. When the government will put them, uh, itself to make sure that everybody enjoys equal freedoms of enterprise, that you have the same freedoms to enjoy this country and you know grow and get richer as I do. Not that the government will go into the business and, for example, I'll convince the government that whatever I want they're supposed to do, so they will be doing and screw you or other way around. Okay? Government shouldn't be in business. It should be in business of letting us being in business on equal rights. And when it comes to xenophobia, let me finish, let me finish one thing. Uh, I will defend xenophobia. Why I defend xenophobia? I didn't mention that in my prolection. Xenophobia, it is something which is very <coughs> basic coming from our hmm? atavistic old experience. What's happened is that the old times when we lived in the, as the humankind, we lived in the small communities. When the stranger came, they burned our houses, they took our goods, they raped our wives, and they killed us. So all of us, we have in our minds when the stranger comes, it is danger. The world changed. Right now, if we want to take the most out of the world we live in, we have to learn to live and benefit from dealing with people who look differently than we do, speak different language than we do, wear a different clothes, go to different churches. Thank you. All right.